All right, well, so I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist, and um, this is always a good talk, I, I think, in terms of what does a neuropsychologist do? And, and I know that because if you ask my parents, uh, they would say, we don't really know. And, and I've had my, my position in my career since about 2002, so coming up on 20 years, and I think my parents still can't explain what I do. So <laughs> we'll work to, to get people to, to understand. So neuropsychology is a little bit different in terms of, um, of typical psychology and and a lot of teams uh, within the MDA and, and with neuromuscular programs will have a neuropsychologist associated with it. So um, at the basic level, clinical neuropsychology is concerned with the behavioral expression of brain functions. So we think about memory and processing speed and language and the front part of the brain where the frontal lobe kind of guides different behaviors. So <clears throat> also, um, emotional behavioral functioning, so anxiety and depression, but to a lesser extent, and we'll kind of talk about that as we as we work through today. So, just in a in a at, again at the basic level, in terms of kind of what the training is required for a neuropsychologist, you'll have a a, a bachelor's degree typically in biology or psychology. Um, there you can you don't have to do those, but those are probably the most prominent. And then you'll move on to get a PhD in, in either child development or clinical psychology or educational psychology, um, sometimes neuroscience. Um, and then after your four or five year PhD program, you have an internship, which is typically in a medical school program, which is one year, and then a, and then a postdoctoral fellowship in neuropsychology that is two years after that. So that's kind of the track. And, and um, again, typically it's people that are more a little bit more interested in brain expression and, and brain function rather than, than kind of the classic psychiatric and clinical psychological issues. So we'll kind of talk, work through today talking about the purposes of a neuropsychological assessment and then the things that we measure and why it might be important for a family to, to think about it or what it can contribute to, to the, the process and, and um, kind of how it, it can, can help with educational planning and, and some of the different roles that a neuropsychologist or neuropsychological assessment can, can contribute. So the, the three kind of biggest purposes are, are for an assessment can look at diagnosis. So sometimes we're trying to sort out um, if someone has dyslexia versus maybe just a mild reading problem, or you could think about it in terms of, of if someone is reporting attention problems, we can measure do they have peer attention problems or is it maybe related to something like uh, an anxiety or a post-concussion syndrome or things like that. So there is a, can be a diagnostic piece to it or a, at least a clarification piece. We do a lot of work with rehabilitation and treatment planning. So we'll work with the rehabilitation teams, the, the physical therapists and speech therapists and occupational therapists and, and help to contribute some to the, to the treatment planning, which we'll talk about each of these just a little bit more as we move through. And then having a component of research as well. So if you have a role like mine, so I'm, I'm the division director of clinical neuroscience at the University of Minnesota Medical School. So I see patients, I have a clinical practice, and then we do some teaching where we have a training program where we, we train neuropsychologists. And then, and then I have research that I, that I do as well. So we kind of, I kind of have all three parts of it within my practice. So um, you can, a person could pick any one of those or any combination of those. And I tend to like to keep things um, pretty varied and interesting. So I do kind of all parts to that. So <clears throat> when we think about diagnosis in something like neuromuscular disorder, obviously the diagnosis is known, right? So there's not going to be a lot of, 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 um, diagnostic clarification there, but in other components, there, there's there's a lot of, of gray areas in terms of what might be driving what and how you might want to ad address the intervention plan. So it can be useful in discriminating between psychiatric and neurological symptoms. It can really look to identify possible neurological disorder in a psychiat in a non psychiatric patient. So um, looking at um, different processing, or again, if people report symptoms of depression, and maybe they've had, a, again, if we think about post-concussion and traumatic brain injury, maybe you've had a, had a series of concussions or in a car accident, and now you're feeling more depressed, and it might be more related to processing speed and, and kind of subsequent sequelae from the, 
from the the incident and it may not be a, a, a psychiatric component so and then helping to distinguish between different neurological conditions or neurocognitive conditions um, uh, neuropsychologists will often work in, a, in an epilepsy center and can really help to to provide data for localizing the site of lesions or or, or seizure onset and things like that and then um, a big role of mine in terms of my practice is screening for um, and, and identifying individuals that are most likely at risk for some specified conditions. So um, we do a lot of, of follow-up and, and screening of uh, patients. So. One of the bigger roles is really the rehabilitation and treatment planning. So patients are, are referred to us for and, and really hoping to get more detailed information about their cognitive status and their strengths and weaknesses. And we'll talk a little bit, we'll touch on what a neuropsychological evaluation is um, in, a, in a few minutes here, but really at the basic level, again, thinking about it, it's a pro we, I, my job is to provide an overall profile of strengths and weaknesses. So is IQ really strong, but maybe processing speed is weaker or memory is weaker, and maybe the, after, an, after an injury or if, if the, in, within different diagnostic profiles or conditions, Perhaps we have to work around something like working memory, where it's not really a deterioration of cognitive ability, but there's some changes in, in memory processing that can be intervened on and, and can be worked around. A lot, what we're finding is a lot of the neuromuscular conditions, um, it, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and, and, and other types of muscular dystrophy and neuromuscular disorders do have a central component in terms of there is a, an impact on the brain function, the cognitive function as well. So it's not always just a peripheral condition. So trying to weigh in and monitor some of, of that can be really useful. So the information about cognitive and emotional status is really important for management. So intervention planning can depend on an understanding of a patient's capabilities and limitations. Um, kind of the basic example that I give for that is is you know in, in our muscular in our duchenne population and the early stages we run into a lot of you know people that are maybe less knowledgeable of it and, and if they see some of the muscle weakness we'll have by ed teachers want the kids to do push-ups and things to to make them stronger and and it, trying to help them understand kind of that is not going to necessarily help in terms of what the the, the plan should be and, and same thing if a child has dyslexia, you may not be able to intervene to make that improve, but you can certainly provide accommodations to work around it. So trying to understand someone's capabilities and limitations can really help to provide some of the intervention planning. So, and then looking at types of neuropsychological changes that, may, that, that an individual may be undergoing. So we'll do a lot of serial assessment over the years and we can watch that trajectory and see what changes and at different age points, there's different expectations. So if you think about <clears throat> things like executive functions, which we'll talk about in a bit in terms of planning and sequencing, there are a lot of changes as kids get into the middle school ranges or even later elementary school. And it's more about the task demands that get harder and it, the child can look like they're, they're decreasing in terms of their abilities, but really it's more related to the, the, what's being expected and asked of them. And again, the interventions can change to, to, to improve that. So and then the impact of these changes on, on, on an individual's experiences of themselves and on their behavior. So trying to, to help people manage and deal with some of those changes better. And, and that, that's where some of the, the therapy comes into play. A lot of neuropsychologists will do some therapy. And like Nicole had said, I, I've done some groups for, for boys with Duchenne and, and done some groups for kids who have a parent with ALS and, and then did more of a parent train, a parent education group and parent support group for kids that, or parents that have a child with a neuromuscular condition. So trying to, to work on and, and monitor that emotional and behavioral side of things is really important as well. <clears throat> the mo a, a really important um, um, aspect of it is to, to provide a, a, an ongoing and, and the most recent neuropsychological status so that therapists and educators can evaluate interventions and monitor the, the, the trajectory and, and the response to intervention. And if kids are not responding to an intervention and we're not seeing gains in processing speed or, or reading or whatever it is that we're trying to improve, 
uh, they can adapt that program and they can change the goals and they can really meet the, the, cha the patient's changing needs and capacities. So uh, that's where we, we will do the repeat evaluations and, and we can weigh in and, and help the, the interventionist maybe plan a little bit differently and, and monitor that um, and monitor that response to intervention, which is what we like to, to use as the phrase for just how is it impacting you and, and are the interventions working? So. And then uh, um, a, an important piece for us too is to just to monitor the trajectory and the neurodegenerative conditions and the neuromuscular conditions. So what is changing for these kids and what pace is that coming and, and is there more of a, of a decline that we didn't expect? So um, that information can be, can be really useful. We, we always hope that we don't see those changes, but if we do, then we can react to it appropriately. So. And then the research side of things. So just like Dr. Dowling talked about, that some of the basic science in terms of, of how, how we can, can learn more about these conditions. There's a lot of research in neuropsychological assessment that looks at, at studying the organization of brain activity and its translation to behavior. So we can look at some of the domains into specific brain disorders and kind of what that might present as behavioral difficulties and, and really, um, again, learn more about some specific age points where things can change and, and we can maybe intervene more proactively. If we can learn about the trajectory of, of a condition or, or the, what the profile looks like, we don't have to wait for difficulties to present. If the research shows us that the majority of kids with this condition have this issue at this age point, and we know that to be true, we can intervene more proactively and not wait for the, the discrepancies to to happen or the difficulties to happen. So that can be a really important aspect too. So for me, a lot of what I do work on are, are metabolic disorders. So our, the, the Minnesota Newborn Screening Program where we screen for metabolic disorders. And then I do our NICU follow-up program. So uh, prematurity and, and kids with perinatal complications with strokes and, and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and things like that. And then some of the neurodegenerative and neuromuscular conditions. Um, um, similar to, or, or the, the, the conditions that the MDA works with. So, so those are my main uh, research populations. There's lots of different things that people do. So um, that's just kind of what I've tracked into over the years. There are a number of types of referrals for neuropsychology. So again, looking at the baseline of, of, of neuropsychological performance for, for an age point for a child and then monitoring improvement or deterioration. And like we talked about before, description of the effects of brain dysfunction on behavior. So we might look at some how, how the post-concussion symptoms can, can present and, and how that might affect someone and, 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 and lead that into, into some of the interventions and the, and the treatments that might be there. And then the longitudinal function in pediatric patients and pediatric conditions, which is really an interesting piece. So we're doing a, we're doing a lot of really good work and the physicians do a lot of really good work at the onset of these conditions. So what we're finding is the longitudinal trajectory looks different. So kids with cystic fibrosis now look different than they, than they did before as we treat the condition better. And, and, and kids with, with perinatal complications and prematurity, they look much different than they used to. And those profiles have changed. And it's really important for us to know as the, as the medical treatments improve and, and really make change, what does that do for development? So that's a really important aspect. And we see a lot of that in, within muscular dystrophy and the MDA populations. As the treatments come out, it changes the, the trajectory for these kids and these families. And it's really important for us to, to know that. So that's a big role of neuropsychology as well. So uh, the, the goals, and in my mind, it really, like I talked about at the beginning, it's really providing a conceptualization. So the conceptualization is that profile of strengths and weaknesses. And then once we do that, we want, once we complete the assessment, we want it to drive intervention. So we want it to be able to provide input into, this is what the school should be thinking about. And, and this can maybe help the speech pathologist to, to adjust their intervention profile. So we want that assessment to, to really drive into to interventions and then doing repeat assessment to monitor for, for how the interventions are working. So those are what I think of as the, the main goals of neuropsych assessment. And then there's some good purpose behind it and, and, and it should really provide a benefit and, and not just doing the evals to do the evals. So. 
these are the domains, the different areas that we, we look at within a neuropsychological assessment. So we think about it as cognitive and intelligence. So an IQ test is, is kind of the foundation of an assessment. And then depending on the question, we'll look at academic achievement in terms of reading and math and, and written language and spelling. We'll look at attention. We'll look at memory and then language and social language. So a lot of neuropsychologists will work in the autism spectrum disorders population and we'll really look at, at social language and, and, and how that's different from language. And then, a, excuse me, a big part of, of um, a lot of the, the conditions is executive function. So the front part of the brain that guides our planning and sequencing and organization. So from that side, um, there's a lot of measures that we use that can really look at the executive function. So, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. I picked a couple of these domains to go into a little bit more in depth, just to, to provide kind of some insight as to how that might be useful for families. And then certainly the, <clears throat> certainly the um, emotional behavior, like I talked about, and then adaptive behavior in terms of how does how does this function look in your daily so in your daily life so how do you deal with social social interaction and, and personal cares as in terms of your, your daily health cares and, and things like that so we'll, we'll try and wane on adaptive behavior as well so i picked a couple i'm not sliding forward I picked a couple of domains to look at. So when we think about IQ, there's a couple different ways to think about it, or, or there's some different components that make up cognitive and, and intellectual functioning. So we think about verbal comprehension or language-based reasoning, which is more of the left side of the brain. And then that can be different from visual spatial reasoning on the right side of the brain. So we think about it, I, I think about it in terms of kind of using language to problem solve more like a lawyer might do. and then visual spatial is more like engineering types of things and, and kind of puzzles and those types of things and math. Those are, those are in different parts of the brain and they can be affected differently by different conditions. So, and then working memory and processing speed are, are really important. So if we think about the brain as a computer, the, lang the verbal comprehension and visual spatial reasoning is like the hard drive and then working memory is more like the RAM, the random access memory that allows you to, to pull up different information at the same time and utilize it. And then processing speed for our brain is just like the processor in the computer. So if you have kind of an aging computer where, work, where RAM and processing speed are starting to slow down, you can have all the good software installed on the hard drive and you can't access it very quickly. So you get more hourglasses as you give the computer commands and it kind of binds up and freezes on you. And then if you back away and give the computer a little bit of time to speed up, then all of a sudden the cursor moves all over the screen and it types out a couple words and it deletes them as you were giving it commands, but the computer wasn't receiving them. And that's just how our brain works. If we give our computer too much information too fast, we freeze up and that's inattention and that's frustration and, and, and disengagement. So it looks very similar for us. So it's important for us to, to really look at those aspects and see how they're affecting. So for academics, for kids, school age kids, we can help to break down reading and, and look at, is it a comprehension, comprehension issue? Is it a fluency issue, but it's not a comprehension? So we look at reading rate and reading accuracy. In math, we can look at how someone might do calculations on for basic math, which can be different than, than math story problems or applied problems. So sometimes kids that have a language weakness, they can do the math problems on the page, but they have really a difficult time with story problems. So we can kind of work around and give them some different techniques on how they can, can manage the language of the story problem. So those are things we can we can help with. And then written language is a really big part of, of working memory and executive functions too. You have to think about how to sequence out a composition or, or your written responses. And if kids have difficulty with, with the front part of the brain, that can really be a struggle for them. So there's some different ways to work around that. 
the big one that we really start to have looked at over the, the, the last 10 to 15 years more in depthly for kids is what we call executive function. So that's the, the frontal lobe and what we call the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And it helps us to manage planning and organization and monitoring, kind of monitoring where you're at and, 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 and where you're at in space and what, you're do, what your brain's doing in those activities, which can, can be affected by attention and processing. And then inhibitory control. So, so when kids are more dysregulated and impulsive, that's really the front part of the brain not working very effectively. And then the ability to shift effectively from one task to another. So we'll see kids and, and people that, that can struggle to shift off of what they're doing onto a new activity. And it can look very much like a behavior problem as kids get frustrated and as we as parents get frustrated. We've given the child a command and they haven't shifted to that new task and that can be really frustrating and it's not always a behavior problem. It can be more of a neurocognitive issue that presents as a behavior problem. Once we've kind of ramped up our emotions and, and escalated, then it becomes more of, an, more of, a, of, a, of a mood and, and behavior problem, even though the, the root cause of it might be more of a neurocognitive piece. So there are some interventions to do with that. So. And then attention is certainly a part of executive functions and trying to, again, sort out, is attention weak because you have poor processing speed or because you have impulse control issues? Or if we just measure attention in your, with tests, is it just really a, a, a kind of a core attention problem? And those have different interventions that can be associated with them. So. In terms of memory, <clears throat> we really look at different types of memory and, and there's verbal memory, so how you remember words, and then there's visual memory in terms of, or how you, obviously how you remember visual information, visual spatial information. And those are two different parts of the brain, again, where you can have really strong verbal memory, but really weak visual memory and vice versa. So sometimes we have to know if there's some differences there. And then we look at short-term versus long-term memory, which again, obviously can, can require different interventions in terms of if how, how you're processing information and pulling it up. Sometimes if you think about the brain as a file cabinet, memory helps us get the files in there and then it depends on how well they're organized in your file cabinet, which determines how quickly you can pull them up and can you find them effectively and efficiently. So we can break apart a little bit the different types of memory issues and, 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 and try and craft some different intervention plans for that. And then the big one is working memory. And that's a little bit different from traditional memory. Working memory is, is more about how you hold information in your head while doing things with it. So <clears throat> a really good example that I'll give to families and feedback for working memory versus memory is use a server in a restaurant. So <clears throat> memory is the server remembering the menu and what all of the specials of the day are. Working memory is me knowing what you ordered to get it back to the kitchen. If I get, disreg if I get disrupted or distracted or you tell me the, the order faster than I can remember it if my processing speed is weaker, I will have trouble getting your order and, and I'll forget that you didn't want pickles on your hamburger but I can remember the, all of the, the menu, right? So my memory is good, but my working memory might be weak. So knowing the differences between that can be really important. Again, because the interventions are different. If you can, if, if you can just write it down, right? And that's a pretty simple um, component, but you have to be aware that you might forget because at the time you're thinking, I'll remember that. And then as you turn and someone else asks you for a glass of water, now you've forgotten what I've ordered. And then now I'm pretty mad as a, as a as a customer and then off we go into having difficulties. So again, that kind of can lead into some different interventions. So <clears throat> I kind of just walked through this slide already. I got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, it, that's really kind of, again, trying to, to work on how we carry out multi-step activities and losing track of what, what we're doing as we work and forgetting what we're supposed to to maybe retrieve when sent on an errand. So those are all sorts of working memory problems. So, and we see that within daily functioning too. So when we talk about kids that can have some difficulty with difficulty with um, getting started on tasks or forgetting their morning routine, sometimes that's a working memory problem. And if we can get the, 
the intervention might be to get it to get the morning routine written out on a dry erase board for the kids so you can reference that and then that helps them walk through the steps a little bit better so um, if we think about kind of how a neuropsychologist can work with the schools again we can help the schools to figure out if they need an intervention or an accommodation so if you have kind of a core dyslexia your brain may not be able to learn to read so an intervention may not be that effective we may hit a ceiling to how well you can read but we can work around that by using books on tape. So your IQ can be very strong and your memory can be very strong. So you can hold that information, but we have to work around the reading problem. So sometimes it's an accommodation, like, a, like books on tape or having someone read the information to you. And other times it's an intervention where we wanna intervene on reading and we can help make you a better reader. So not everybody that has a reading problem has dyslexia and, and you can actually respond to the intervention. So, so that's one of the, the big ed educational pieces and, and um, kind of thinking about what are effective elements in a program and trying to make the day go more efficiently for the kids. And, and if you have processing speed issues or the kids get more fatigued, if you think about the kids with neuromuscular <clears throat> conditions, the day can be pretty taxing for them as you, you are, I'm sure, fully aware of parents that have a child with a neuromuscular condition. So what can we do to make that easier on them and, and help kind of grease the skids for the day for them a little bit? So <clears throat> that's where, where we'll work with the schools on, on what effects might be more persistent and <clears throat> help the school to do more formal and informal assessment to, to monitor that. So <clears throat> that's kind of what my job is to work with the schools and and help with an IEP, an individual education plan, or a 504 plan, and, and help the schools maybe understand these things a little bit differently. So schools are really good. They have really good toolkits. Sometimes for these different conditions, we have to help them pull different tools out of their toolkit, but they don't usually need new tools. They just need to use a different combination of them. So. And then finally, a, a role that some neuropsychologists have, or they at least work with a team, that does it is to really think about mental health and emotional and behavioral functioning. So um, especially as related to medical conditions. So my, my kind of psychology practice is really more about pediatric psychology where we work with kids with medical, kids and families with medical conditions and how you kind of adapt to that and, and how you work with it. So if we think about the emotional and behavioral functioning side, there's some different things that we, we focus on. So maybe at the time of diagnosis, the work is more focused on parental adjustment. So maybe if the child's very young when they get a diagnosis, the child may not be as aware. But we have to work a lot with the parents to adjust to, to that diagnosis. And then kind of monitoring for the ongoing psychological distress that can be associated with extended decline in functioning. So <clears throat> unfortunately with these, with neuromuscular conditions, the, the decline is extended over time. So it can really, as, as families are aware, can really be, it can pop up at different times. And sometimes we kind of, it fades back into the background a little bit and other times it can, becomes more, more prominent. So we have to work to monitor and, and, and help families manage that distress. And then thinking about our kids, especially with muscular dystrophy as they, you know, at, at that nine, 10, 11 year range, the kids can start to focus a little bit more on the loss of mobility or functions. And then it becomes more aware for them and we want them to have that age appropriate and accurate information so that they can learn to deal with it too and, and, and kind of meet the kids and the families where they're at in terms of, of, of what they're focused on, what maybe they've learned and how distressing that is to them and, and, and address some of that anticipation anxiety. So, and then assisting families adapting to the change. So um, helping a family to communicate about wheelchairs to a child or, or or, or other family members that maybe, maybe don't have as good of an understanding of what's going on. So those are some of the things that we'll, we'll work on. So um, <clears throat> for children and adolescents, um, they report a lot of obstacles to adapting to the diagnosis. And we haven't always matched those interventions to the types of problems that they encounter. So we wanna try and help the kids fit the condition or the disease into their lifestyle. Rather than, their, rather than their lifestyle into the disease. So we want to work on barrier reduction and goal setting and kind of figure out what the kids wanna do and how do they wanna communicate things to people and, and how they wanna be seen 
uh, you know, with, with, within their condition and, and not have it be maybe the definition of them. So there's a lot of work from the therapeutic side that can go on as well. So, and then lastly, some of the family interventions. So like I talked about a little bit ago, assisting with family communication and, and there's a lot of stress that happens with these conditions. So parents sometimes need to, to learn better ways to communicate and, and, and to people manage their emotions with these things differently. So, so we can help facilitate that. Um, what I like to focus on is dealing with the loss of healthy status. So there's a very rare parent that plans for neuromuscular conditions or medical conditions and, and, and kind of grieving that loss of healthy status doesn't mean that you're giving up or not focusing on treatments and, and cures and interventions and things like that. But you have to acknowledge that this is a change that you weren't planning on. And, and it's okay to both grieve the loss of, of that healthy child or healthy status and not feel guilty about it. So that's a big part of it, um, especially as these conditions move into newborn screening where, where maybe the, the, the child is asymptomatic and yet we know they have a condition. So that's a very devastating piece that happens differently than sometimes when there's a symptom onset. So, and then dealing with anticipation anxiety. So similar to as, as parents are kind of monitoring that trajectory and they're getting closer to maybe some, some, some more um, apparent decline and, and as kids are getting closer to sitting down into a wheelchair and things like that, dealing with that anticipation anxiety. And, and if we're, if we're, if kids start to, not want to present themselves at school if they've had a change in their function and, and a lot of anxiety around presentation and, and what do we tell people and, and how do we answer questions. So, And then some long-term planning for kids as maybe they get closer to an endpoint or, or closer to, to, to whether it's either a change or whether it's end of life types of planning. So we'll work a lot with families. On, on communicating that and making sure all of the appropriate conversations have been had and and we know kind of what legacy planning needs to happen and things like that. And so that's the harder part, but it's still very real and, and needs to be addressed. And we want families to, to not have any regrets about you know, not having conversations or, or asking questions and things like that. So that's a, that's a big part of it as well. So just in summary, <clears throat> I mean, in terms of thinking about neuropsychology, it can really help to provide an overall profile of strengths and weaknesses that really, like I talked about, should, should drive the intervention planning both at home and at school. And then a big part of it is if combined with pediatric psychology or with a larger team or if some people have a dual role like myself, you can address the emotional and behavioral issues associated with diagnoses and outcomes. So. So that's really kind of in a little bit bigger nutshell of what neuropsychology is and what a neuropsychologist does and why it can be helpful within a team or, 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 or within, a, within a, a clinical setting. So um, that's all that I have. I Thank can take you, some Dr. questions, Boyce. Nicole. And... Um, I was curious, when working with a school, um, would the school reach out to a neuropsychologist or um, or I guess what I'm trying to get at is once you once the school does an evaluation, hmm. would they then tell the parent and the it's the parent's responsibility to reach out to a neuropsychologist, or would the school automatically say, "Hey, we have a neuropsychologist that can help you"? I'm sure it probably varies, but yeah, it's usually it's going from out to into the schools, right? So the schools are not going to have a neuropsychologist, and they may do part of the evaluation that's done for the individual, if a school has done an assessment, it would be a pretty good chunk of a neuropsych evaluation, but they're not gonna do some of the memory test and executive functions and kind of what I call the part two of an event. They're gonna do academic, or they're gonna do an IQ test and academics and think about some of the, they'll do a little bit of emotional and behavioral types of things, but maybe will not, um, you know, won't do that whole picture. So. I'll partner up with the school and, and work with them on, on that profile. And, and, you know, they don't have to listen to us. They, they, okay. it, it works better if we, by, by law, they're not required to listen to us. So we kind of have to enter in gently and, and usually that amounts to a family and I'll help coach the family to say, you know, we've had this outside evaluation. Would it be appropriate for, for Dr. Boys to come to the table and kind of talk about, the findings and if I do it correctly, I, I don't irritate the school and, and kind of offend them, you know, and, and mm -hmm. help them to understand that profile and, and, and 
you know, within any school district or any school, they're not going to have a lot of, of experience with neuromuscular conditions, right? Mm -hmm. So these are just different things. And, and again, they have the toolkit. We just have to help them to, to do a little bit differently. So it would be the family inviting us in. And, okay. and there, there's a, there can be a bit of a turf war between neuropsychologists and schools. And I always kind of say, but if I was a school psychologist and some guy out in the community or a clinician on the community was telling me what to do, I probably wouldn't react to that very well. So it's nice to kind of figure out how to partner up and do that and, and manage it. So it's about relationships and, and, and working as a team. So. Okay. And if a parent wanted to reach out to um, locate a neuropsychologist in their area, is there an association that you guys belong to or how well, would one... Okay. Yeah, so there's a couple different, you know, the, there's the, the National Academy of Neuropsychology and there's the International Neuropsych Society. There's a few. If you just do kind of a general search, um, you know, you, they, they'll, they'll probably pop up and, and different clinics will identify as having a neuropsychologist. So it's usually it's just a kind of a search like you'd find any other, any other provider. So it, it's pretty specific. So it usually pops up pretty, pretty readily if, if, if there are in the community. So. Okay. Um, we had a question come in. Have you noticed any correlations in chemical fluctuations within the peripheral areas um, that are underwear or distress and mental or cognitive difficulties occurring around the same time peripheral distress is occurring? Yeah, I think that's a really good question in terms of, of kind of the what's driving some of the maybe the, the behavioral or neurocognitive presentation. So if you are distressed or depressed, processing, can, processing speed can be weaker if I, if I understand the, the question in terms of it, the, the peripheral distress can result in, in what might be perceived as central decline, right? So processing speed can be weaker. It may not be true decline. It would be if someone's more depressed or more anxious or more, or, or more overwhelmed because of their, their change in peripheral functioning. Um, and that certainly is gonna then trigger some change in, in neurotransmitter and, and chemical fluctuations. I don't know if it's quite as direct as, as a daily fluctuation. I think it's gonna be probably a, a bigger piece, but what we can measure is you know, that more core processing speed and function and say, all right, under ideal conditions, your processing speed is still good. If you're feeling it on a daily basis, it might be because you're more overwhelmed or, or, or you've been more stressed about maybe the change or anxiety is increasing and that's causing to be more distracted. So okay. in muscular dystrophy, we know that dystrophin is centrally, is central now. We think it, we thought it in the years past, early in my career, it used to just be thought of as a peripheral condition. And we know that Duchenne muscular dystrophy has a central a, 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 a brain component to it too. So I don't know if that answered the question very well. I don't think we're gonna see kind of daily fluctuations, but certainly you could present with, with central decline and not actually have it. It could be related to maybe if you're distressed peripherally, or if you're distressed at your motor function and that change, that can drive down processing speed and you'd see it that way, so. Okay, well, I hope that answered it. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, Dr. Boys. I don't see anything pleasure. else that have come through. So thank you for taking time out today. My pleasure, thanks for having me.